Uh, good evening, good morning, good afternoon to everyone around the world. Um, welcome to the uh, OTEA uh, monthly online sharing event today. Um, today we have a very, uh, uh, my special guest, um, she's going to talk about uh, the oldest engineering association in the United States. So our speaker today is Amy Moore. Um, I personally know her, I work with her in the same office. And last year I saw her uh, winning the um, Fly Iron um, Young Engineer of the Year on the webpage. I got so excited and I, that's, that's very impressive. And I immediately thought I should um, invite her to be our guest speaker here. So here she is. Um, Amy, she's hardworking, promising young engineer. And aside other than, than working, she's very uh, active in a lot of uh, volunteering, uh, volunteering works. And she also uh, win the best chili uh, contest in last year's chili event. Um, she didn't cook this year. I told her if she cooked the same recipe, I will still vote her. I will vote for her again. Um, so um, um, it's our great pleasure to have Amy here today. So uh, without further ado, I'm gonna hand the microphone to Amy. Oh, by the way, just a little announcement today. Um, today we won't have a Chinese session. So uh, after the uh, uh, she presentation and we will proceed with a uh, Q&A with in English and we will extend it a, li a little bit to like a 9.15 ish. It depends on how many questions we get, but we will not have a Chinese session today. Okay, um, Amy, I I'm going to get you start the presentation. Okay, great. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, just a note, you know, I, I cooked chili last year, but I decided that I needed to give everyone else an opportunity to win this year. Uh, so maybe next year, maybe I'll bring my chili back next year. Um, so tonight I wanna talk about opportunities in civil engineering in general, and then also in um, the American Society of Civil Engineers, which as Elizabeth said, is the oldest engineering society. Um, so who am I? Um, like Elizabeth mentioned, I work for Flatiron Construction. I've been with them for five years full time and I did intern for one year prior to that. Um, I am currently working on the 405 Renton to Bellevue widening in Seattle, Washington, which is what Elizabeth is working on as well. Um, prior to that, I helped build a um, stormwater treatment uh, center in the same area of Seattle. It can treat up to 72 million gallons a day. Um, it only is active during heavy rain events because it is meant to help deal with that excess flow during those events. Um, I attended, prior to working for Flatiron, I attended University of Washington. Um, I have my Bachelor's of Science in Civil Engineering. I graduated from there in 2018. Um, I also received my engineering and training certificate during that time. Um, and like Elizabeth mentioned, I am the president of the AOCE Younger Members Forum in Seattle. Uh, I've been involved with them for about uh, four years now, but I was involved in school as well. So overall, probably seven years of AOCE. Um, and we'll get into a little bit more of what AOCE entails. So uh, what is civil engineering? Most of you probably are already somewhat familiar with that. Um, civil engineers help engineer the environment around us. Um, you know, our roads, our bridges, our buildings, civil engineers touch a lot of our built environment. There are many different types of civil engineers, like I mentioned, roads, bridges, airports, dams, um, transit, trains, bus lanes, tunnels, all kinds of stuff. Civil engineers touch just about everything. What can you do as a civil engineer? Um, there are a lot of disciplines within the profession. Um, a very common uh, discipline that people go into is structural engineering, actually checking that building structure or that uh, bridge structure to make sure that that structure can hold itself up and withstand any loads from gravity, from wind, from earthquakes. Uh, these are some examples of what structural engineers can work on. Um, I'm not sure if you can see my mouse, but in the in the top center here, we have the Eiffel Tower in Paris, France, and the Space Needle in Seattle, Washington, where I'm from. Um, 
There's also the Golden Gate Bridge in the bottom center uh, in San Francisco, California, or on the bottom left, this is CenturyLink Field, one of our big stadiums in the Seattle area. Uh, structural engineers have to touch pretty much any structure to make sure that it is sturdy enough to withstand any loads that will uh, be applied to it. The next field is transportation engineering. Um, obviously engineering how to move people from place to place. Um, this involves the alignment of roads, traffic signals, road design. You know, are you gonna have a traffic signal or a roundabout? It can also involve transit. Um, so designing where do we want bus lanes? Where's the most efficient place to put bus lanes? Do we need to go above and beyond a bus and uh, have a subway for transit? Should that subway be in a tunnel? All that kind of stuff. Um, in the bottom center here is the light rail, which is in Seattle, Washington. That is our version of a subway. Um, other examples, airports, um, highways down here. Um, bottom left is a new highway tunnel in Seattle, which replaced a seismically vulnerable bridge that was there beforehand. And then, of course, our beautiful uh, landmark ferry system in Seattle, Washington as well. Another aspect of civil engineering is geotechnical engineering. Um, all these structures we're building, uh, they do have foundations below them, and we need to make sure that those foundations are thoughtfully designed and that they can um, help support that's whatever structure we're building. Um, geotechnical engineers use principles of rock and soil to determine what type of foundations we need, if we need ground improvements, if we need shallow foundations or deep foundations. Um, and they're also involved in earthquake engineering a bit, um, especially with like liquefaction of soils uh, during earthquakes. More examples of what geotechnical Nicole engineers can work on. Um, in the bottom left, we have the Oso landslide, which occurred about an hour north of Seattle, I want to say about 10 years ago. That I think is the deadliest landslide that ever happened in the United States. Um, it killed around 40 people. Um, there was a community down here. On the center right, uh, this these are com apartment complexes that fell over due to poor geotechnical engineering. That's in about any geotechnical textbook you'll ever see. Um, so geotechnical engineering is very important to make sure that whatever we're building has a strong foundation. Another aspect of civil engineering is water or hydrology engineering and environmental engineering. Um, these are the people who make sure that we have adequate storm drainage, who make sure that our water is being treated adequately before we drink it or before the storm water is entering a body of water in our area. Um, these types of engineers also work on dams and designing the dams, making sure that our waterways are well cared for. Um, another aspect of civil engineering is construction management or engineering. Um, this is what I personally work on. This is my discipline. Um, we plan, execute, we plan and execute construction work. Um, it's a little bit more variable whether we're all involved in design or not. Um, it depends on our contract type, but essentially we take a set of plans and we make sure that they are built safely, effectively, and with quality in mind. Um, one example of what a construction engineer can work on, um, this was my Georgetown wet weather treatment plant that I worked on prior um, to my current project. You can see all of the um, different kind of um, vegetables that the water had to work through in this right-hand picture here. This is our main treatment building on that project. Um, and on the left-hand picture here, this is um, our main collection basin for all the water on the treatment plant. And it was 100 feet deep from where I'm standing. Um, and we had to pour an elevated slab to cap off that structure. So this was our false work to help pour that slab. Um, a couple more examples of that same project. Um, this was that treatment building I showed before. We were erecting the steel superstructure and then eventually the roof on top of half of it. This was a large part of my scope on that project. I managed that steel erector. It was a lot of fun. 
Um, but also we had a lot of issues with steel fitment. So it taught me a lot in how to find solutions to problems after you already have steel fabricated. Um, the next thing I want to mention about civil engineering, um, obviously you can go into any of those disciplines that I just mentioned, um, but at least in the United States, being a licensed professional engineer can be fairly important depending on which discipline you're working in and if you're designing or not. Um, it can also be important if you're not designing in other capacities, um, but having that professional engineer title is super important. Um, so I kind of listed the steps here of how to get your license in the United States, because that's what I'm familiar with. Um, so some of the main things are to get a four-year degree in civil engineering from an ABET accredited institution. Uh, if you would like to get your professional engineering license in a different discipline, such as mechanical engineering or um, aerospace engineering, I believe they have the similar requirements, um, but it is ultimately up to the state that you want to be licensed in. Um, pretty much any discipline of engineering will need you to get your EIT certificate ahead of time, which I mentioned earlier, I do have. I got it while I was in college. You have to take a four-hour test to get that, um, and usually it's pretty much what you're studying in that college program, so it's a good idea to take it at the same time. Um, after you get that EIT certificate and you're graduated from your program, you're going to want to work underneath a registered professional engineer because there are very specific um, experience requirements uh, between graduating and getting your professional engineer's license. Um, and once you have whatever experience is required, it does vary by state. In Washington state, it's four years. In California state, it's two years. You know, it really varies depending on the state. But after you have whatever experience you need, you can go ahead and take that test. It's an eight hour test um, for civil engineering. You take a four hour session in the morning that covers all of civil engineering. It, it's like the broad portion. Um, and then whatever discipline, geotechnical, construction, structural, et cetera, you take a four hour session in the afternoon that will cover very in-depth questions about your specific discipline that you would like to get licensed in. So it's a big step for most engineers. I have not quite made it there yet, but I do know people who have, and it's a pretty exciting moment when you do pass that test. Um, after you pass, you apply for your license in whatever state you want to be registered in. Many people are registered in multiple states. Um, California is a bit harder to get registered in, so most people will get registered there, and other states will accept that registration as proof that you are qualified to be registered in that state. Um, so a lot of people get registered in California and then will apply to Washington, Oregon, um, Idaho, Nevada, wherever they want to be licensed. Um, and after you get your PE license, there are continuing education requirements that you need to fulfill. It can be as easy as having like 20 hours of continuing education every year. But again, those requirements kind of uh, differ by the state or by the entity that is giving you that license. Um, so that is the first part of my presentation about civil engineering. Um, before I move on to the AOCE organization, should we take a moment and ask any questions about that part of the presentation? So moving on to AOCE, um, we are the American Society of Civil Engineers, but even though American is in our name, um, we definitely are a multinational organization now. Um, we were founded in 1852, uh, but since then, uh, on to 2023, we have expanded quite a bit. Um, we have 10 regions uh, that we just divide up our membership geographically. Um, Washington State is in Region 8, along with a lot of other Western states. You can see Washington up here. Seattle's in the very kind of edge over here. California State, because they are so large and have so much population, are their own region, Region 9. You can see all the other regions in the U.S. here. Um, we have Canada and Mexico incorporated with our North American regions as well. And then Region 10 is the rest of the world, including anyone in Asia or Taiwan. So uh, overall, big national worldwide ASCE. Um, the purpose is to help you matter more and enable you to make a bigger difference with the vision of civil engineers being global leaders and building a better quality of life, and the mission to deliver value to our members, advance civil engineering, and protect the public health and safety and welfare. 
Um, AOCE is, like I mentioned, a worldwide organization. They do write certain code books uh, to help with the civil engineering profession and making sure that we are designing and constructing in a safe and quality way. This is AOCE 716 here. Um, there are additional uh, discounts and resources such as this code book provided to AOCE members. We also have a salary survey that is sent out to every member worldwide that can help people um, make sure that they are earning what is industry standard for them and their position and help give them a negotiating tool if they're not. AOCE uh, also has seven technical institutes. Like I mentioned, civil engineering is a broad discipline. There's or a broad industry. There's a lot of disciplines within civil engineering. So the technical institutes are ASCE's way of trying to address everyone's desire for technical content in an effective way. Um, I'm a part of the Construction Institute because I am a construction engineer. Um, there's also things such as the Geo Institute, which a lot of geotechnical engineers join, um, the Coasts, Ocean, Ports, and Rivers Institute because that's pretty specialized work. Um, you'll get geotechnical engineers in that, you'll get water engineers in that. Um, there's the Environmental and Water Resources Institute for people who are working in wastewater or in environmental re remediation. Um, and you can read the rest of them here. There's, there's something for everyone and there's really good technical content there. Um, so like I mentioned, I am the president of the Seattle Younger Members Forum. So I built a little flow chart here because it's kind of confusing, like what is the Younger Members Forum? Where does that fit in? Um, so we have ASCE Nationals way up here. That's the worldwide organization. And then, as I mentioned, there's different regions. So you go down to Region 8, which is where Washington State falls in. You can see the, the leadership over here. Um, Region 8 is further divided up into sections, which are more discrete geographical areas where everyone um, within that area is kind of within the same region. So I'm part of Seattle section. I live in Seattle, Washington. Um, and then below that, uh, we have the Seattle section YMF, which is the Younger Members Forum. We are uh, essentially helping address the needs of members 35 and younger because many of us are younger in our careers and um, it's really important for us to network and we have a bit less of that technical knowledge that someone 20 or 25 years into their career would have. So I am the president of the Seattle section YMF. Um, the YMF, our purpose is to advance Seattle young professionals in the civil engineering community. Our vision is very similar to the Nationals vision to help build a better quality of life through sustainable, equitable and diverse communities and networks. And our mission is to connect, support, and inspire younger members to engage in their communities through all of these various things that we'll talk about. Um, even if you don't live in Seattle, Washington, many, many, many different sections within AOCE have a younger members forum, if that is something that you're interested in. Um, AOCE is like a broad, wide reaching organization. Um, and the best way to organize that is geographically. So you can go online and look up uh, different chapters of ASCE, different sections, and find the one closest to you and find a group. But a lot of these things that I'm going to address really apply throughout all of ASCE because we do have that national purpose, vision, and mission. So what does Seattle YMF do? Um, our three main pillars are professional development, networking, and community outreach. Um, you can see some photos up at the top here going from left to right. Um, on the left is a uh, our board from one year ago who attended a conference for the Western United States in Salt Lake City, Utah. Um, next picture is was a technical tour that the YMF put on. Um, next picture was the executive forum that we held in Seattle, Washington, getting executives of large engineering companies throughout the region to come do a presentation for all of our membership. And the last picture on the right is our popsicle stick bridge competition that we hold every year where we have um, high school students come and engage via building a popsicle stick bridge to help get them um, engaged in STEM and interested in engineering. We'll touch a little bit more on all of these in a minute. Um, we have a large 
a number of board positions within Seattle. We're a pretty big and active YMF compared to many other places in the nation. Um, these are all of my committee chairs uh, that are on my board. Some of them aren't filled. My board this year has about 15 people who are pretty active. Um, but as you can see, we, we have a large variety of different things that we work on every single year. And so we, I have committee chairs help me fill all these positions. Like I mentioned, networking is very important to who we are as the YMF. We do a lot of social networking events. Um, we have a monthly networking happy hour, uh, either in Seattle or in a nearby city. Um, we have an annual holiday party and an annual year end picnic. Our picnic was actually this week. We went to a big um, park in Seattle and had some Qdoba, which is Mexican food um, that we shared with everyone. We also hold an annual ski retreat. Um, some years we do a recreational sports team. We'll attend um, professional baseball games. Our local team is the Mariners. And we do a lot of hiking or backpacking. And we also try to interface with nearby regions like Bellingham, which is a city two hours north, Portland, which is a city three hours south, um, and then our Spokane region as well, which is about four hours east. Other items that we do are community involvement. We focus on both community service and then um, as well as student STEM outreach. Uh, so we work a lot on kindergarten through 12th grade STEM outreach, of course, focusing on the civil engineering aspect of STEM. Um, like I mentioned, we do our popsicle stick bridge competition. We typically have 12 to 15 bridges, which are all built by high school teams. Um, we bring everyone together on one day. We load test those bridges live um, and we give out prizes to the winners of strongest bridge, most efficient bridge. The students really love it. Um, and it's a great way to connect students with STEM and hopefully build those future civil engineers. Um, this top picture here is a program we do called Rebuilding Together. Uh, once a year, uh, we partner with the organization, which is called Rebuilding Together, and they find a community member in need and we help go do uh, repairs to their house. Um, and then our bottom picture is a K-12 outreach workshop we hold. We typically hold, you know, four to five of these a year at various schools who invite us to come host a booth and help educate students about what is civil engineering. Um, we also hand out high school scholarships and we support our local colleges, including University of Washington, Seattle University, and University of British Columbia, helping support those civil engineering students through their um, time in school and then hopefully getting them to continue to be involved in ASCE after they graduate. Uh, yep, so university outreach, I was just talking about some things we do with that. We do resume reviews, uh, we do Q&A, younger member professional panels. I've been on two of those panels in the past month. We just gather a wide variety of civil engineers and we let the students ask us whatever's on their mind. We get questions about internships, about the EIT exam, about how did you choose what discipline of civil engineering you went into, it's all over the board. Um, we also do a lot of professional development events. This can be technical tours where we go to an active project in the area, such as our light rail, which is getting built out and hear from people who are working on that project about the technical aspects behind it. Um, we do office tours where we can go get to know the culture of a local office in the area and um, see where their office is, what the layout is, you know, what do they do for fun, that kind of stuff. And then, as I mentioned, we do an, an executive forum every year. Um, that picture is in the top right. Last year, we had executives from uh, Boeing, the Washington St State Department of Transportation. Um, I believe we had an executive from King County as well, which is another governmental organization. Um, as I mentioned, we hand out scholarships to high schoolers, really trying to help further those future civil engineers. Um, and then lastly, we also have a wide variety of AOCE conferences that are available to our membership. Um, there's a national AOCE convention every year that has a lot of technical content. Um, there's also a National Younger Member Leadership Symposium that helps teach those soft skills to a lot of the leadership in YMFs. And then my favorite is um, this RIMAC conference I have listed at the bottom. Um, this is the Western portion of the US. 
um, so regions eight and nine, we all gather for a weekend every year, get to meet each other, get to network, get to swap ideas about what's going well in your YMF and what's going poorly. And you just really get to create good friends, good connections, and learn about um, all the civil engineering work that's going on within your region of the United States. Um, that's why I'm lost, which I already talked about. And then RIMAC, um, it, the location changes every year that we host it. So um, on the bottom here, this was our conference in San Francisco in 2020, just before the United States started to shut down for COVID. Um, the top left picture was in Hawaii in 2019. And then the top right picture was in Park City, Utah in 2022. Seattle, Washington will be hosting uh, RIMAC in 2024 in February. We're really excited for it. Um, we made kind of a funny video that I thought would be a fun way to wrap up um, because we have to bid to uh, host this conference. So we were trying to convince everyone that we would be the fun place to go. I can kind of show you the highlights of our YMF and our um, city. Um, and it includes some references to movies so hopefully everyone um, is fairly well-versed in movie culture. So um, that concludes my presentation about civil engineering and the American Society of Civil Engineers. Thank you so much for having me, and I'd like to open it up to any questions. Thank you, Amy. That's uh, wonderful. You share a lot of details uh, I, I never know before. And um, let's dive into the questions uh, in the chat box first. Uh, first, we have David Yan. He's asking, what's the most challenging thing for you as a civil engineer in your career? Yeah. Um, I think one of the most challenging things is not actually a technical problem. Um, it's that in construction, I get to work with a wide variety of people. Um, so I went through school and I was around a lot of um, other people who were working on engineering and around a lot of professors. Um, but in my job that I've had since graduating from school, I'm not only around engineers, I'm around foremen and superintendents and the people who are literally swinging hammers to build the infrastructure that we're building. Um, and so to be able to communicate effectively from a foreman or a superintendent is, very diff is a very different style of communication than communicating to a designer or a project manager or someone who works for the government who owns this infrastructure we're building. So uh, building different ways of communicating and being able to understand what anyone is telling me despite um, their different backgrounds, right? Because a carpenter might tell me something, oh, you know, like I don't, I had a really hard time making this form work. Um, and I have to kind of pull out of that, oh, like these plans we were given actually were wrong and were not buildable. And so we need to be able to communicate why they were wrong and why they weren't buildable to the designer and um, communicate that problem to help come to a solution. So it's like translating from from many different people coming from different aspects of building infrastructure and understanding why they're telling you what they're telling you and why it's important. Thank you, Amy. Um, next question we have from Oliver. She, he asks, does the state utilize BIM a lot in the construction industry, like 3D simulation and clash detections? Um, I would say for heavy civil infrastructure, which is what I work on, um, we use BIM a lot less than you would expect. Um, you see it more in building construction where you are trying to um, foresee conflicts between different systems. You know, buildings can get really congested between your HVAC, your water, your drainage, all of that, or and your electrical as well. Um, so you see it a lot more in buildings than you do in infrastructure. The only time I've ever personally worked with BIM was the steel erection I kind of touched on earlier, which was more focused on building construction because that was the, the superstructure for a building. Thanks, Amy. Um, another one from Panson, he, he asked, it's impossible to make sure our construction work is 100% accurate to the drawings. Sometimes contractors and workers make mistakes. Is there any barrier when you ask them to correct those mistakes, especially in, when costs and construction progress? Are, are involved in the situation, like schedule schedule and cost issue? 
Um, yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, we definitely make mistakes all the time. Um, it can be a carpenter or a rebar tire not reading their drawings correctly. It can be the drafter who drew those drawings not interpreting the contract drawings correctly. It can be the permanent designer uh, having conflicts within the drawings that they've issued for construction. So you're right, there's a huge um, potential for mistakes and mistakes do happen. Um, on the projects I work on, which are government owned, there is a huge push on quality assurance and quality control. Uh, we have owner inspectors with us every single day watching us, making sure um, we're doing things to the um, correct quality levels required. Um, and we have hold points as such. So a rebar inspection is a very common hold point where everyone stops what they're doing. Um, we've scheduled it. We said we're done tying the rebar. Inspectors come out with the approved contract drawings. They're looking at them versus the, the rebar cage over here, and they're pointing out everything we did wrong. Um, and it happens a lot that we have mistakes in there that we need to correct before pouring concrete into that formwork around that rebar. Um, and it also happens a lot that we find these mistakes the day before we were gonna pour that concrete and we have to cancel that concrete pour, which costs money. We have to delay that concrete pour, which delays the schedule, which ultimately costs money. And it's a very um, stressful situation and a very unfortunate situation. Um, but ultimately, we as the contractor owe the owner a quality project built per plan. And it's our responsibility to make sure that we're doing that. And if we said, hey, we're done with the three bar and it wasn't correct, we do have to eat that schedule and that budget that, that, that fixing that mistake takes. Um, so in an ideal world, we will learn from our mistakes and not make those mistakes in the future. Um, but unfortunately it does happen. And it's a good thing that we have these hold points to um, have time to check our work before it becomes a lot harder to fix if there was a mistake in it. Uh, thank you, Amy, for the brilliant presentation. Uh, my question is, what percentage of women in the construction industry in USA? Do you have an idea? Um, I do have an idea. It varies whether you're talking about staff women or craft women. So staff are people like me, engineers, or people like Elizabeth on the cost team, um, our administrative people who handle payroll or um, uh, our district managers in construction. For staff people, I think it's about 15%. Um, it, you, you know, on the project that Elizabeth and I are currently working on, I think it does hover around there. It might be a little bit higher, especially away from the engineering team. Um, on the engineering team, we have about, I wanna say 30 people who are operations engineers, and we are hovering around that 15 to 20% ratio. Um, when I've been on smaller projects, you can definitely see it a bit more. Um, you know, I have often been the only female engineer on a project where there were five or six engineers. Um, there, I even today, I am often the only woman in a meeting. Um, but I, I can't do anything about that other than continue to perform well, show that women are just as good as men. We are good employees, we are smart, we are intelligent, we are organized, um, and also help try to mentor women who join the company and make sure they feel comfortable and they feel like they have a place to talk. Um, for craft people, like carpenters, laborers, people pouring the concrete, people tying the rebar, that percentage is closer to 6% of women in construction. Um, it's it, it's a lot tougher out there. I think it is getting better. There are certain disciplines that have more women, um, like electricians. I think you're going to see more like maybe 10% women in the electricians trade. Uh, but that is something that, uh, I mean, in America, we have a, a shortage of craft people anyway. And so making sure that anyone feels comfortable joining that kind of profession is only going to help improve those numbers and help lessen that craft shortage as well. Thanks, Amy. Uh, I can uh, get my, a little bit input about the electrical uh, craft there because I was intern for an electrical uh, local company in Seattle when I was in school. Yeah, the, the among all the the craft, we have a uh, like a if we have thirty craft people, uh, electricians, there are like two or three are female. So that ratio yep. at least like 
of three, five years ago. Is that's about right. Um, I hope it will, it, it keeps increasing because um, m many times they, uh, the, so the female electricians, they bring like a, a different mindset and different ideas than their male uh, coworkers. Okay, so here we have another question from Ming Hong. Actually, Ming Hong, you can just unmute your microphone and ask Amy directly. You don't have to type. <laughs> okay, Ming Hong, I want to ask, what's the reason for you to reach high school students by offering scholarship? Um, may I ask, where do you get the funding? <laughs> okay, um, well, like I mentioned, one of our pillars as an organization is community outreach. And that's one of our pillars because one, we care about our community. Um, I mean, we work a lot with the environment. And so why are we doing that if not for our community? Um, but also civil engineering is a really important profession and we want to continue to uh, help people access that profession and be able to go into that profession. Um, you know, if we if we don't have civil engineers moving forwards, our society and our community will not be able to function the way that we do. Um, I think in America, we have a great faith in our infrastructure and in our buildings, and that is largely due to civil engineers and the care that we put into our profession. And so it's in everyone's best interest to make sure that we are continuing to attract intelligent, motivated people to this profession. Um, our funding for that, uh, as an ASCE member, you do pay membership dues, which go to the national organization. Um, they distribute those dues to the various sections and chapters um, based on membership and in, based on membership. Um, so that is a budget line item that we include in our budget every year because it's important to who we are as an organization and our mission. Thank you, Amy. Um, so, okay, while you are thinking about what question to ask Amy, I'm gonna ask mine. <laughs> okay. Okay, uh, David, okay, you can go first. Uh, I see you raise uh, your hand. This baby, Please. yeah. Uh, uh, it's amazing uh, so, uh, your presentation, uh, but uh, I have uh, I wonder if do you have anything uh, would uh, like to address to uh, other civil engineering, especially for uh, uh, male civil engineering, how to treat uh, civil engineering engineer like uh, you in the workspace so we can encourage more female civil engineering participate uh, our working environment like this. Thank you. Um, okay, so how, you know, any civil engineers should treat um, other civil engineers, especially women, to encourage a diverse workforce. Um, I, I don't think that women in the profession need to be given special treatment. I think they need to be given equal treatment. Um, and so ensuring that women are included in all aspects, um, making sure that they're invited to meetings they need to be invited to, that they are given the same opportunities as their male, male colleagues, um, and that they feel comfortable in their workplace. Um, especially in construction, you know, we're a little bit more of a rough and tumble industry sometimes. Um, there can be occasions where there are inappropriate conversations or inappropriate ways of addressing women I have run into those and luckily I'm comfortable enough in my job where I can um, contact someone who can help and I, I've had occasions where I've had to do that and say hey you know could, could you talk to your foreman and ask him to stop calling me sweetheart like that's not really professional you know like <laughs> um, that's a pretty uh, tame example but, but just things like that, you know, if you're not going to call a male colleague sweetheart, don't call a female colleague sweetheart. I personally don't have um, children yet, but uh, child care and childbearing is a pretty large impact on a woman's life. And so making sure that female employees feel supported through that process and that um, if they choose to have a family, it won't affect their career is also really important and, and giving women the accommodations they need throughout um, their decision to have a family and to uh, pursue that equally important aspect to their life as their career, making sure that 
uh, they feel supported to have both of those at once. My question is, uh, in Taiwan, uh, many young civil engineers, when they graduated from university, they changed their career. Yeah, but uh, I, I was wondering, in the United States, uh, will civil engineer graduates, uh, they change their career? Yeah, after the graduation and they change to computer science, something like that. Yeah, I do have a few friends who I graduated with from our civil engineering program who have since changed to computer science. Um, I have a few other friends who graduated from different engineering disciplines who have since changed to computer science. Um, I think that speaks to one, the demand to have computer science engineers, um, but it also speaks to the skills we learn in an engineering degree. Um, you know, a lot of what you do day to day in an engineering job, you're learning on the job. You didn't learn it in school so much. And, and really what school is teaching us is how to approach a problem, how to solve a problem. Um, and many of those skills are transferable um, between engineering disciplines. Um, I'm still in civil engineering. I think it's really important work uh making sure that we have safe infrastructure and buildings to live in and to exist in is extremely important to our communities and our societies um but uh computer science is also important we are becoming more and more of a digital uh computer uh, uh world and so you know if people change they change but they're still using those skills they learned when they got their engineering degree. Thanks, Amy. Uh, we have one uh, question in chat box from Gillian. Uh, she asked, thank you for your presentation. What are the distinctions between a field engineer and a project engineer? How do they? How do their respective roles influence the project progress and ensure adherence to the project specifications and timelines? What's the difference between these two roles? Yeah. That's a good question. Um, that will depend a bit between companies. Um, some companies don't even have a position called a field engineer. They just start you right out of school and call you a project engineer. Um, so I guess I'll speak to Flatiron's kind of view about field engineers and project engineers. Um, field engineers do tend to be in the field more. And the intention with that is they are a bit younger in their career and they need to um, learn how to build and see how things are built, see the processes behind it, kind of understand what's going on in the field day to day. Um, and we, we kind of view being in the field as a really good learning experience. Um, also in the field, you are learning how to make judgment calls and how to answer questions quickly. Um, because kind of speaking to that communication I mentioned earlier, you're getting questions from from carpenters, from foremen, from laborers, and you're having to, it, it doesn't always like translate really easily to specifications, but you kind of have to understand their question and then figure out what specification to go look at to help answer their question and make sure um, that they are building compliantly and, and to the quality standards that we have on the project. Um, for project engineers, they start to take a higher level overview of some work, you know, a field engineer might have planned one wall and how to build that one wall really detailed. Um, but a project engineer might be dealing with four or five or 10 walls. And uh, what? how do you get access to build that wall? Do you need a temporary wall? Do you need a shoring wall? Um, do you need to build an embankment to get to that wall? And, and our, if we're going to wall one and then wall two and then wall three, kind of making sure that we're working on planning all three of those walls at once um so that they'll basically just like work on larger broader scopes rather than getting really into the details for one scope um also actually as a project engineer you can work more on the project control side of things too um so working more on the cost team um or on the scheduling team um it's at that point in your career that you're really starting to try to get um more of a wide range of experience so that eventually if you're becoming a project manager and you have to manage all of those things, the construction, the schedule and the budget for one project, you have experience within all three of those aspects of construction. Thank you, Amy, for the very detailed questions. Um, so uh, do we see 
any other path any any questions well um i do have a few questions so uh, amy from your presentation I, I i see the 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 core one of the core value of ASCE is a uh, is community service um i noticed you you mentioned it, it multiple times and help building not just infrastructure not just taking care of the environment but taking care of the people and I'm especially interested in that mentorship uh, you, you mentioned uh, on one of your board members. So uh, I want to know, uh, these can be very helpful for the foreigner engineers like, like me, like most of us, uh, most of our audience. Like how can we find the resource to find, find a mentor in, in ASCE? Or if you are more experienced, you want to help the younger generation or how can you become one mentors in, mentoring in ASCE? Yeah. Um, so it can vary between different AOCE sections, um, but for the section I'm a part of, the Seattle YMF, like you mentioned, we have a mentoring chair. Um, so we do a mentor program every year where we ask for volunteers um, just via our social media and via our newsletter. We ask for volunteers to both be mentors and mentees. Um, the mentees would be people probably either in school or maybe five or 10 years out of school. And then the mentors would be those people with more of 15, 20, 25 years of experience. Um, so it just kind of works out that usually we get pretty similar numbers of volunteers for mentees and mentors. And then we try to match them up based on discipline or interests or, you know, when you're filling out the form to become a mentee or a mentor, we ask these questions so we can help match you up with the right person. Um, and then we encourage each pair to meet once a month, I believe and just kind of talk through what they're seeing at work, what questions they might have, um, what are good things to do to help advance your career. Um, so we do that once a month. I think we typically send out the interest forms in October or November, and then the program will be like December to June or thereabouts. Um, you can also find mentors in your own career. You know, often it's a boss or someone on your team um, that you have an open conversation with. It doesn't always need to be as formal as a mentoring program, um, but just like finding someone within your company or within whatever project you're working on, that you can have an open conversation with and say, hey, you know, I had this come up, like what would you have done in this situation? Or I'm not sure if I handled this well, like can you give me some advice? Um, I have found that if you're willing to ask the question, people are typically willing to answer. Thank you, Amy. Uh, that's very, uh, that's very, very detailed answer. But um, I, I do have one last question. Um, so Amy, so uh, where, can we find those three resources that maybe searching, maybe searching online? Is there any uh, like social media will you recommend us to use to find those resources within ASCE? Um, ASCE.org is a great starting place. That's where you can look up any sections local to you. Um, I can also share the link tree for the Seattle YMF, um, but that's very Seattle specific, you know? Um, uh, but just kind of finding a region local to you and then signing up for their newsletter should help you get in the know about any local events, um, which are often virtual too, um, and, and get involved. Um, you know, and if ASCE isn't exactly what you're interested in, um, there's plenty of other organizations too. You know, there's a American Society of Mechanical Engineers, um, there's water resources organizations. So there's definitely a... Um, professional organization for whatever you're interested in. Gotcha. Thank you, Amy. Um, I'm going to ask you for the for the link of your video, and I'll make sure it we put it in on our Facebook and our uh, video of of these uh, events. So um, let's give everyone, give Amy a big applause because she did put a lot of effort in this presentation, and also she covered a wide variety of topics from uh, early, early in your career, uh, challenging like a challenging part as a young engineer, woman engineer, or like family, like mentor and salary, community building and everything. So uh, thank you, Amy, for a wonderful presentation. And I, I hope you have a great weekend. I will see you next week. And thank you everyone for joining us this, uh, this evening, this morning. Um, I, I'm sure everyone learned a lot from, from these events. Okay, um, 
we're gonna hang up right here okay everyone have a great weekend thank, thank you thank you for having me thank you amy